Hello, everybody, and welcome to Expat Kingdom. This is Lane Livingston, and today I'm really excited because I've got the opportunity to speak to Steve Saint, which uh, many of you may not be familiar with his story, and others will. Um, but uh, it's really a neat history and a lot of just fantastic, fascinating little details that intertwine with Ecuador. So I thought it would be fantastic to have him on the show today and just kind of explain that so that uh, anybody that's considering a move to Ecuador would kind of know this this history and, and these little details about um, really about Ecuador and, and how, you know, this is something that I think really anybody that's considering a move down there should be familiar with and, and know this part of Ecuador's history. So, um, Steve, just a huge thank you for coming on today. I really appreciate your time. And uh, if you don't mind, just kind of give us a little bit of a background on on your family's history and, you know, just kind of what I'm alluding to in, in, in this, you know, intro here. Uh, Lane, uh, you know, I just was going through some uh, memorabilia that we had and I, I found something that I hadn't seen before, uh, Life Magazine in Spanish. This was the, uh, this was the uh, January 30, 1956. Um, version of Life magazine. I've got it in English, but uh, it tells the story of uh, that I'm going to tell you. Uh, I was born in Quito, Ecuador. My mother was from Idaho and my dad was from Pennsylvania, but they had gone down to Ecuador because uh, people were moving into the jungles, especially missionaries, after World War II. And uh, it's really hard to get into the jungles in Ecuador from the capital city. In fact, I knew one family that uh, would take a mule train over the Andes Mountains and down into the jungles. And then um, then they would go by canoe and trail and canoe again and trail. It would take them about 30 days to get from Quito into a, a place that they live called Sucua. But uh, when my parents got there, and they set up a base on the edge of the Amazon jungles right at the end of the road. I mean, the, the buses or cars coming down from the mountains would go past our house about oh, 100 meters and then would turn around and there was no place else to go. Um, it, uh, when mom and dad got down there with a the little plane, a little, um, well, they had a little single engine plane, the uh, Moffats, the family that were taking 30 days to get into Sukua, could instead could get on an old bus and they could make it down to Shell in about 10 or 12 hours, depending on what condition the road was in. And then, uh, and then Dad could fly them from Shell, Meta, into their mission station of Sukua in about oh, 40, 45 minutes, I think. Mm. So a 30-day ordeal turned into a one day and 45 minute trip. Um, I was born in Quito, as I said, and then immediately uh, went down to Shell. Shell Meta is named for the Shell Oil Company and for the last town just a little bit further up towards the mountains called Meta, named after an, uh, an Ecuadorian poet. Um, so the oil company came down out of the mountains, followed what was just a uh, barely passable road, they improved it. They went past Meta, and the first level piece of ground they came to, they built an airstrip, and that became Shelmetta. I lived in Shelmetta for the first five years of my life until my dad was speared uh, with four of his friends by a tribe of Indians that everybody called Alcas. But uh, Alca is the Quechua word that means savages or naked savages. Mm -hmm. I think the word actually comes from naked, but uh, it denoted uh, people that were, you know, almost like animals. Uh, their real name was Waurani. Wau means true people and Ani refers to the group. So they were the group of true people. Um, we stayed down in Shell for a year after my dad and his friends were speared to death. And, uh, then we moved to the States for one year. So I had first grade in California. Then we moved back to Ecuador. And uh, I really lived the rest of my growing up years in, uh, in Ecuador. 
the first six in the jungles, and then uh, from then through high school up in Quito, where there was a, an English-speaking school that I went to. Um, the, the contact with the uh, with the Waurani after oh two and a half years. Let's see, Dad was Dad and Roger, Pete, Ed, and Jim were speared in um, January eighth of nineteen fifty six. And then in October of 1958, um, my aunt Rachel, my dad's sister, had been living with out on the Nacienda um, where a young girl who had fled from the Waurani tribe because she was sure that she was going to be killed by her own people. She fled preferring to be shot by the Quichuas, but when she and, um, she and two other girls made their way into Quichua territory, uh, Dayuma told her friends that she was going to just run to the Quichuas, hoping that they wouldn't shoot her. Well, when she ran, they um, they were going to shoot her, but they were afraid to use their shots on a woman because they were sure that the woman would come first and then the men would come and spear them. So they didn't shoot Dayuma. And then when she got to them, then she called her two friends and they came out too. And uh, Dayuma had been living on this Hacienda Ila for... Oh, I think probably 10, 12 years before Aunt Rachel found that Dayuma was there. And then Aunt Rachel got permission from the Hacienda owner to move to the Hacienda to live with Dayuma so that Dayuma could begin teaching her uh, her people's language called Wao Terero, True People Talk. And uh, then um, in 1958, Two other women, actually three women, came out of the jungles into a Quechua clearing. There were a bunch of Quechua women washing clothes, and these three women, Mintaka, Menkamo, and uh, Dawa, came out of the jungles, and uh, they began to. The women began to scream until they realized that it was just women. And then, when the men, hearing their screaming, the men ran for their muzzle-loading shotguns because they knew the scream meant that. They were being attacked by Waurani. But when the men got back to shoot the women, the Quechua women got around the, the Waurani women because they didn't want them to be killed. And uh, one of the women who ended up being my tribal grandmother, Dawa, the two women told her to go back because they had come from uh, where they were living in Damuintaro. They had come, the three women, with Kimo, Dawa's husband. And uh, the two women told Dawa to go back into the jungles because they were sure that if none of them went back, then Kimo would think that they had been killed and then he would come and spear somebody and then the Kichwas really would kill them. So Dawa went back and Mintaka and Mangamo stayed there in the little Kichwa village on the, uh, let's see, Tobetaro. Um, I'm trying to remember the Spanish name for it, but at any rate, it wasn't very far from a, a small town called Arajuno, where the Shell Oil Company had uh, set up base out in the jungles. Um, from there, um, Aunt Rachel was traveling with Dayuma when she heard that Mintaka and Mangamo had come out of the jungles and got pictures. Dayuma realized that these were two of her aunts, although she hadn't seen them for a long time. So Dayuma and Aunt Rachel made their way to Arahono and the two women um, had come out of the had come out of the Waurani territory just about the time that Elizabeth Elliot, the wife of one of the men that was killed with my dad, was traveling through that part of the jungles. And uh, the Kichwas came and said to her, There are two Waurani women living with us or two Alkas with us. Do you want to see them? And Aunt Betty said, Of course I do. So she went and met them, and they couldn't speak the same language, but using sign language, she invited them to come back to live with her in uh, a little jungle clearing called uh, Shandia. And uh, the two women lived there with her for, I think, about three months until Aunt Rachel and Dayuma got back from traveling in the U.S. And uh, when they were reunited, and Dayuma um, told them well, when they saw that she was still alive, they were just absolutely amazed because they were sure that all outsiders were cannibals 
and they figured that Dayuma had been uh, killed and eaten years before father and mother, then she she wanted to go visit them. And the two women said, we've got to go in and tell our people that it is possible to live in peace without killing and uh, without hating and killing, which was an absolutely novel idea to them. The Waurani were, I think, the, are the most violent people group that any any anthropologists have ever studied. They had a homicide rate of about sixty uh, percent within the tribe, plus those that were killed by the uh, Kichwas or the oil companies. Because any of the oil company people or Kichwas that ever saw Waurani, they would just shoot them on sight. Um, and of course, the Waurani would spear them if they found them. Um, Let's see that they uh, Aunt Betty or Betty Elizabeth Elliot. I called her Aunt Betty. She was my real aunt. Mm -hmm. But uh, Aunt Betty and Aunt Rachel, my real aunt Rachel, went in then to live with the Waurani in October of 1958. And um, I read Aunt Rachel's journals after she died. And uh, there were at least three times when they were threatening to kill Aunt Rachel to spear her. And she knew enough of the language that she knew that they were going to spear her, but you'd have had to know Aunt Rachel to know that uh, she was sure that nobody could kill her unless God allowed it. And if God didn't allow it, then they wouldn't spear her. And if God did allow it, well, then why not be speared? Uh, she was an unusual woman. Um, I first went in and met the Waurani in, uh, I think it must have been Christmas of 1960 could have been 19, I think it was Christmas of 1960 because Aunt Betty uh, and her daughter Valerie were still living um, in a place, uh, an, another village that they had started called Tiwano. Mm -hmm. And it's usually the villages take their name from the rivers. So it was on the Tiwano River. And uh, Aunt Rachel at first, Dayuma had a son named Kanto, in the, that's his tribal name. And she named him for her father, Kanto, and for my uncle, Sam, Aunt Rachel's oldest brother. So uh, Sam, Kanto, and um, Dayuma wanted to take him in to the tribe, but she was pretty sure that if she took him in right away, that the men would spear him, fearing that when he grew up that, you know, he, had, he would have vendettas against them. So in Christmas of 1960 or 61, um, Dayuma finally decided it was safe to take in Sam, and Aunt Rachel talked my mother into letting me go in with her when Sam went in. So that was my first meeting with the Waurani, and then I've had a relationship with them uh, since then. So what what was that like then for, I mean, do you, have you had conversations with your mother as far as, I mean, that must have been a, a challenging situation for her to get approached by aunt rachel and say hey let's go live with the very tribe who who killed your your husband and the father of your children so i mean can you just kind of share a little bit of you know maybe what that was like for your mother um you know i don't i don't know what went through my mom's mind but um um aunt rachel had by that time been living with the wild two years and Aunt Betty was in there with her daughter, Valerie, um, who was only a year old. Mm -hmm. um, I guess by that, well, by that time she was three and I was, I was probably seven, eight, I was probably eight. And, um, you know, she had gotten along fine and the Waurani were extremely friendly by that time. Um, although they're extremely volatile, so it's, you know, they... They don't plan killings a long time ahead of time. Somebody gets upset about something or quite often the Waurani would go on a spearing raid when they were afraid that the people that they were going to go spear were actually uh, planning to come spear them. And they would just decide, hey, before they come and kill us, let's go and kill them. Mm -hmm. um, for me, the first meeting was, um, I mean, people ask me, weren't you afraid? But, you know, my, my dad and his friends thought the Waurani were so special that they were willing to go and they all had guns. So, you know, when the, when they were attacked by the Waurani, it's, um, oh, the Waurani were extremely capable killers, but, uh, 
there's no way that they would have been able to kill all five when they had guns. Um, but Dad and his friends had decided that if they were attacked, now they didn't want to be attacked, and at night, three of them would sleep in a treehouse that they, my dad and uh, Jim Elliott had prefabricated and took in, and they put it way up in an ironwood tree and with steps going up to it. But my dad would fly out every night to uh, Arajuno with uh, the plane and the lightest member of the group, who was uh, Pete Fleming. Um, because the, the river's out there, you know, it's right at the headwaters, so if it rains upriver, I mean, the river can go from, you know, just shallow knee-deep. They can go to a torrent that would have um, just washed, washed away. the plane. Yeah, because yeah, mm -hmm. the plane, Dad landed on a sandbar that was just barely above the water uh, level. Yeah. And um, uh, let's see, where were we? Oh, going to meet them. You know, when I got out of the plane, every time I would go into a jungle station, the, the tribal people would come up and, you know, they'd feel my white skin and uh, I had hair on my arms, which they really don't. And uh, then I was wearing glasses and black rimmed glasses. And, you know, they thought those were growing out of my head. So that scared a lot of them. At least the kids would go screaming, you know, when I'd come near. <laughs> um, but... The, the Waurani, when I got out of the plane, they didn't come up to me. Now, Aunt Rachel was around. The pilot's door was on the other side. I'd gotten out on the side by myself, and I was really surprised because all the people gathered around were looking at me, but uh, they were talking. Um, I couldn't understand what they were saying, but obviously they were talking about me. And finally, an old grandmother came up and started patting me down, you know, to see if I had the beginnings of breasts because I was tall enough that... Well, Rani, if I was a girl, then I would have had breasts already. And she figured out I didn't have breasts. And so finally she pulled out my pants. I had uh, elastic waisted pants. She pulled those out and looked inside. And then everybody started to laugh, um, realizing that I was just a little boy. And uh, from then on, they were just extremely friendly. And Aunt Rachel didn't have any rules um, you know, if the Waurani kids or men were, or women were going hunting and took me along, I could go with them. Uh, although that was pretty painful for me because they would drink a lot of manioc drink and plantain drink before they'd go into the jungles. And then they would go, I mean, they would go sometimes just to go around the bend to uh, net little fish. And then the men would see taper tracks or... Uh, or wild pig tracks, and they would go off. Of course, I would go with them, and they would go all day, and my tank wasn't nearly as big as theirs. So, I mean, I'd, I'd get so hungry and tired that uh, I would absolutely decide I'm never going to do that again. And then the <laughs> next time they wanted to go hunting, you know, I was game for it. I should have learned to take some, some uh, manioc, some boiled manioc with me because I couldn't eat nearly as much as the wild honey. Even the Waurani kids could. Um, that so that relationship started when I was eight, and uh, but then when we moved back, I had first grade in in California. When we moved back to Ecuador, then my mom lived in Quito. She was a nurse, and she uh, uh, worked in a in a mission hospital in Quito called the Bosandes Hospital, and. Um, uh, and then she ran a guest house, so we had people coming through all the time. And once in a while, once in a great while, Aunt Rachel would come up to Quito with some Waurani, so I got to meet them again there. And then in summers or Christmas vacations, um, on a fairly regular basis, I would go out and live with Aunt Rachel in Tijuana. That's neat. That's really neat. So what uh, what is like a typical day like for... For the, the typical day like for the wild honey? Yeah, what, what, what's a typical day like for the wild honey? Uh, the wild honey would begin calling each other um, before the sun was up. And, uh, okay, I had a message in front of your face. That's fine. <laughs> uh, a typical day for the wild honey would start... Um, you know, I'd hear first. I'd hear the women fanning up the the uh, fires, and uh, 
getting whatever was in the pot from the night before, getting it up uh, nice and hot again. Um, and then they usually had smoking racks above the fire where any meat that they had had left, they would leave in the smoke. Um, and uh, so I'd hear the fanning of the, uh, of the fires. And then the men would start calling each other and, and the women too. And the men would usually be calling to each other saying, uh, you know, are there pigs around or did anybody see a deer? Or, or they, would, they would tell each other, you know, what they were going to go hunt that day. Or if they had a bunch of meat on the uh, on the smoking rack, then they would, you know, call and say, "I'm going to work in the garden today." And somebody else would say, "Oh, I saw the the a fruit ripe on a certain tree, and uh, I know the two cons are going to come and eat it. So I'm going to go and I'm going to uh, I'm going to shoot two cons and bring those home to eat." They would do that with a blowgun, and um, I always wondered, you know, how can they know what they're going to find? But they would be as they would make their way through the jungles. You know, they would watch for signs, uh, different things that were ripening, so they would know where the pigs were going to be, and they would know where the uh, various kind of birds would be. And then, quite all the time, when they'd go into the jungles, they would find trees that had fruit that they liked to suck on. They they said uh, they always said that they were going to drink. Um, a certain kind of fruit, and then they would usually bring a bunch of that back to the uh, clearing. So I got to participate in that, but I I went with them. I mean, almost on a daily basis, I would go into the jungles with the Wawadani, or I'd go into the gardens when they'd work in the gardens, and uh, they would try to get me to uh, do what they were doing and laugh, you know, when I couldn't do it. <laughs> but I, I started learning, you know, I got pretty handy with a, a blowgun and uh, I could throw a spear and uh, I could spear fish, although it really takes special technique, you know, because when when your spear goes into the water, it seems to change direction. So they would always stick the tip in the water so that they could see, you know, the uh, the angle of their spear in the water. And uh, I never got really good at, at uh, spearing fish. You got to really hit them fast to spear them. But... Uh, I really loved living with the Wawadani. After after they'd been out, usually the men, if they went out hunting, they'd usually be back with something by noon. And uh, then they would go down to the river and bathe. They were real clean people. M- most of them would bathe in the morning before they'd do anything. Really? And, then they'd, and then they'd bathe at, at noon when they'd come back in from hunting or from working the garden. And then quite often in the hottest part of the day, um, they would lay in their hammocks and they would chant or they would eat. And then, uh, again, in the afternoon, they would go out either to gather fruit from the, um, jungles or to, uh, get manioc or plantains from their gardens. And, um, and then again, late afternoon, they were usually down at the river, you know, spearing, the kids would spear little, uh, sucker fish, you know, they'd turn over stones and shoot little sucker fish and, uh, and the little girls would take their nets and go and try to net little fish, which were real tasty. They'd uh, they'd roast them in the fire and then eat them. Oh wow! Uh, what what is uh, what is manioc? Manioc is a tuber. It grows underground like a potato. Um, it actually is, I think, the most widely eaten food on on Earth right now. Rice is number one, and I think manioc is number two. Most people here in the states have eaten manioc without knowing it. Uh, it's also called yuca. Okay, uh, that's yeah. I was going to ask. Cassava. Okay, yeah. I was going to ask if it was you if it was similar to yuca. But. In, uh, the, the in uh, tapioca pudding, the little balls in tapioca pudding are manioc. Yeah. So most people up here have eaten tapioca. They just didn't know what they were eating. Yeah. Very neat. Okay. I also thought you said something kind of interesting about how. Uh, let's say they would see a fruit and instead of just immediately saying, okay, I'm going to take that fruit, they would actually leave it so that they would, they could let other animals come and then they could kill the animals. Uh, well, yeah, those were, those were, there are a lot of fruit that the different animals would eat. Some that the people would eat, but, uh, usually, well, usually the birds would eat fruit that, uh, 
that people wouldn't eat. Um, yeah, and I, you know, people love to uh, tell what environmental, how environmentally sensitive people like the Waurani were, but I remember going out hunting, and this when I was an adult, going out hunting for monkeys with a friend, and uh, I heard chopping, and I was, you know, we had gotten separated, but, you know, you could call to a nade call, doo you know, and you, it travels a long ways in the jungle, so that meant that whoever I was hunting with was looking for me, or more often I was doing it to mm-hmm. get them to uh, come back and find me. Um, but I heard this chopping, so I made my way through the jungles, and just before I got to where the chopping was happening, I heard a tree fall. And when I got there, um, this Waurani friend was uh, was gathering fruit from the from the tree that now was on the ground, and... Uh, I said, uh, you know, why did you cut the tree down? He said, because I wanted to drink the fruit. And I said, but um, but now the next season, uh, there won't be fruit on this tree. And he said, yeah, but there are other trees. Yeah. So well, instead of climbing the tree, he just decided to chop it down. <laughs> um, so much for environmentally sensitive. Yeah. Well, I would imagine. I mean, their footprint is so much smaller than than ours. Oh, tiny. Yeah. Tiny. What kind of population is in the Wodani tribe? When I first, well, I I lived uh, the the uh, group that I lived with, and that Aunt Rachel lived with, um, were called the Edomanani. The the tribe was divided up into clans, but the clans were divided into two major groupings: the Edomanani and the Anomanani. The Edomanani that lived further upriver, all the rivers flow out there, flow from uh, west to east, mm-hmm. and end up out in the uh, in the Amazon River. Um, so I was with the Edomanani, and the uh, the clan was the Gikiteidi, named for the most prolific killer in the group, Gikita. Um, there really weren't. Um, I don't. I think the Gikiteidi were the were really the only real clan of the upriver people. The downriver people had a bunch of clans. Uh, and maybe it was that when Aunt Rachel and Aunt Betty got out there and Dayuma started teaching the people not only how to live in peace without killing each other, which which is a big deal. I mean, meant that people had to live then with people that they had killing vendettas against, you know, people that had killed members of their family. But the, the Waurani, I mean, living in such a violent society was not fun. I think they just didn't know of any mechanism because they had no chiefs, no elders, everybody uh, extremely egalitarian group where everybody just did whatever they wanted to do. And um, if somebody did something that you didn't like, you either just overlooked it or you killed them. I mean, there was no no penal system other than that. and if you killed them, then their family had a vendetta against you or against your family, so they'd kill somebody in your family. So that, I mean, the killing was just rampant. Mm-hmm. And, and in the evenings when the men would be laying in their hammocks and talking, I would ask Aunt Rachel sometime, tell me what they're saying. And th- there were really just two topics. They would talk about their hunting expedition, you know, that day or some other day, or uh, killing raids that they had been on. Um, so like we talk about sports, they would talk about uh, killing raids that they'd been on and how they speared people and where they speared them and who lived the longest or somebody that they had speared. And then they started chanting so they didn't kill them. They just left them speared, you know, dying slowly so that they could hear them chant or so that they could uh, talk to them while they were dying, you know, and Tell them, you know, how angry they were that uh, that their brothers or sisters or somebody had killed somebody in their family. Um, really um, strange culture for somebody that had come from what was, uh, I mean, people would come and steal your things. But uh, I don't remember ever hearing in Shalmetta, ever hearing of somebody killing somebody else. Right. I'm sure it happened, but... Than to go in and hear Waurani talking about killing each other all the time. And they would also talk 
about uh, members of their family that had been killed and quite often killed by um, by outsiders. Like uh, one of the one of the warriors came went to my aunt Rachel one day and uh, he was pretty upset because I was already as big as um, wild honey kids that could go out and shoot monkeys and and even once in a while spear a deer and uh, I couldn't really follow a trail I couldn't you know I didn't know how to chase pigs and spear them and I could I could shoot the blowgun pretty well so I could get monkeys once in a while but never the big monkeys that were way up high I'd usually get the yakita the little um, painted face monkeys uh, but the big ones that really were good for me the uh, howlers and the woolly monkeys and uh, capuchin monkeys could get pretty big. Those, you know, I I wasn't quite wily enough to get those when I was a kid. So Minkai, one of the warriors who had killed my dad and his four friends, he went to Aunt Rachel's hut and asked her or said, you know, your son, they called me Babe. He said, uh, Babe is totally ignorant. He doesn't know how to uh, how to make darts. He doesn't know what vines to get the poison from. He can't follow a trail well. Uh, he can shoot the blowgun okay, but uh, he can't chase pigs and spear them or deer. He doesn't know where they go and what they eat. And So he finally said, so who's going to teach him? And my Aunt Rachel, who wasn't a pushover, she said, you having spear killed his father, who do you say should teach him? And Minkai left, but that afternoon he came back, and I never knew this because I, you know, I didn't understand what was going on, and I don't think I was there when Minkai came. But Aunt Rachel wrote it in a letter to my mom, and she said that Minkai came back a couple hours later, and he said it's true. Having spear killed his father, I myself will teach him to live. And uh, from then on, I was treated in Minkai's household. Well, Minkai lived with another man and his family, Nimonga, and that was usual. They would live uh, two men together, which gave them uh, a better or reduced their chance of being speared because then there was somebody else that could avenge the spearing immediately. Um, but from then on in Minkai's house, I could go in. In fact, um, one day his son Oroki and uh, some other friends my age were going hunting uh, blowgun hunting, and uh, I didn't have a blowgun, and Oroki told me to take Minkai's blowgun. But Aunt Rachel had explained to me that the Waurani didn't really consider most property personal, uh, except their hammock, and their house, and uh, and a man's blowgun. And uh, so I, I knew what Oroki wanted me to take his dad's blowgun, and then he was going to let me use his blowgun, and, and he was going to use Minkai's but if something happened to it, then I was going to be in trouble. So I didn't want to do it, and I didn't want to do it. But finally, he insisted. So I took Minkai's blowgun, and uh, he let me carry it, and he let me use it. Uh, and then when I came back, when we came back from hunting, Minkai was in his hammock right below where they they would hang their uh, blowguns from a vine up in the in the peak of the house so they could hang down straight because if you if you put them horizontally they would um, they would warp and uh, when I went in to put it away Minkai was there and I thought now I'm in trouble but Minkai didn't even look at me and then I realized he really is treating me like a son um, even and giving me some uh, more latitude than even his own boys wow. so I could go into their house anytime and and eat out of the pot I didn't have to ask. I could just go and eat. So um, I really, I, I, my kids call Minkai Meme Minkai, Grandfather Minkai. And he really became kind of a surrogate father to me when I was in the jungles. Mm. Wow, that's phenomenal. So I have a couple questions too then regarding, um, you, you know, talking about personal property and all that. Is there, is there some kind of an agreement with the Ecuadorian government or anything along those lines on what what property or what territory is theirs or you know how does that how does that work I'm I'm not sure exactly what the process was but uh, 
Aunt Rachel, you know, as soon as the Waurani quit killing, the uh, Kichwas started to come into their territory to hunt because the Kichwas had pretty well hunted and fished out their rivers and, and territory. Um, they started raising some animals, uh, chickens, and, you know, the, the Kichwas not so much, but a few of them had cattle. Um, but they loved to go into Waurani territory. In fact, they started looking for, you know, ways to marry some of their less desirable daughters to uh, uh, Waurani men, which would give them a right to go into the territory and hunt and fish. But uh, Aunt Rachel and Dayuma uh, realized that they needed somehow to protect Waurani territory. The Waurani had already always protected it by walking along the borders between their territory and Kichwa territory. And if they ever found Kichwas in their territory, then they would spear them unless the Kichwas saw them first and shot them. Um, but Aunt Rachel and Ayuma and I think uh, Kanto Sam were all involved in going to the government and asking for a, a reservation or a protectorate, they called it. And the uh, government did give them one, but it wasn't very big. And then when the um, when I was in um, oh, high school, the Edomanani went and made contact with the Anomanani, um, and it was kind of a mutual thing. The Anomanani had a uh, uh, an epidemic of polio going through their through their clans, and uh, they came up river. I don't know if they were. I don't know if they knew that the uh, the Edomanani were living peacefully or what, but um, I think I think maybe somebody from the Upriver tribe that had been kidnapped uh, earlier had contact with the Downriver group, and uh, they went down there and found that they were all sick and dying. So they, they got them and, and encouraged them to come upriver, and when they got the Tiwano, then uh, Aunt Rachel got in touch with a uh, missionary doctor, Wally Swanson, who diagnosed it as being polio. And, uh, uh, you know, when their diaphragms would become uh, paralyzed, then the people would just suffocate to death. So Wally uh, uh, showed Aunt Rachel how to make uh, boards or planks or got the men to make planks. And then they would make a teeter-totter and the uh, Waurani from the Edomanani would teeter-totter the people so that when their head was down, their diaphragm would fall, you know, up towards their lungs and would push air out. And then when they um, tip them the other way so that their feet were down, then their diaphragm would fall. But for some of those people, for weeks, somebody had to be with them, you know, around the clock. And the uh, strange thing was that Aunt Rachel told me later, and, and so did... Sam and some of the others that while the Edomanani were were breathing that way for the uh, Anomanani, that the Anomanani would threaten them and say, when I get strong, I'm going to spear you, which, you know, would seem like a dumb thing to do. But uh, they were extremely aggressive. And the uh, I know that Dewey and Minkai and their wives um, would would breathe that way, you know, would work and they and they had to feed the Anomanani too, you know, out of their own gardens, which meant that food got pretty scarce. Mm -hmm. And I know that because I was invited to go on overflights with the Anomanani there. It wasn't safe for me to be in there. Um, but I got to go on overflights where we'd get you know, flour and uh, quadruple baguette and we send in potatoes um, and things and we'd fly, the plane would fly low over the airstrip and I would sit in the back and push those things out of the door, which didn't work very well. Even the, the uh, helio couriers that, uh, jungle aviation and radio service had can fly at probably, oh, safely at 45 miles an hour and low. But, uh, man, when the flower sacks would hit the runway, I mean, it looked like a mushroom cloud, uh, but it would be concentrated enough that the people could pick it up with uh, scrapers or machetes or things. The potatoes were better. Um, the bags there, too, would break, but the potatoes would stay 
more or less whole. And then they could boil the potatoes. And uh, if they mashed them, they were, you know, in the mash consistency, which the Waurani would then take and mix in water. Um, but the potatoes, when they were boiled and mashed, were fairly similar to the uh, manioc or the cassava yuca. Wow. So l let me ask you then, too, with... Um... If, if I'm not mistaken, with your Aunt Rachel down there and everything and, and going into the tri tribe, actually submersing yourself and, and just kind of, um, I, I guess, just that through that experience, did she actually uh, introduce them to Christ and to the Bible and everything, if I'm not mistaken? Well, Aunt Rachel, living with Dayuma, had, had told Dayuma that she followed um what in what the the Waurani call Wangungi Taro, the Creator's Trail. And um and Aunt Rachel had told her stories, you know, about how uh, Wangungi the Creator didn't see it well that people should live angry and hating and killing each other and that they shouldn't steal and that they shouldn't um you know the men shouldn't sleep with uh, somebody else's wife and uh and Dayuma was especially um, intrigued by stories of creation. Now, the Waurani all, all believed that there was a creator that they called Wangungi. And, um, I mean, they saw trees, and especially the ones bearing fruit, and that manioc would, uh, would grow and things. Um, and they figured that Wangungi made it so that they could live. And then they had one more thing, uh, and this really gave them a connection. Their only connection with the Creator uh, was uh, stone axe heads that they call a wanka. If uh, when I was a kid, if you would take a stone axe head and you would ask the Waurani Kinui, "What is this?" Um, the word for it was a wanka, but they would usually say Wangongi Gui, that this is. Uh, Wangungi is the word for God or for the Creator, and Gui is uh, excrement. So they would say, This is the Creator's excrement. And I didn't understand that. And I asked Aunt Rachel, and Aunt Rachel said, Well, you know, the Waurani can't live without these stone axes. That's what they use to chop down trees. But the Waurani never made stone axes, uh, they would just find them in the jungles. And that seemed wanted to marry and start his own clearing, he could only do it if he had an Awanka accent. Um, and, uh, you know, they, I would say, where did you find them? And they'd say, we would just, we would just find them. And then one day, I think I was, um, it was when we had moved back there, and I'm getting ahead of the story, but uh, when I was an adult, I was walking along a beach one day, and we always look for a manita stone. It's a type of flint. It's red with yellow around the edges that makes a real good knife. And that's manita is what they call that stone. And so they call knives manita even today. But uh, we'd always be looking for manita. And I was walking along and I saw a strange shaped stone and I pulled it out of the sand and it was uh, it was an axe head. Hmm. So... Time for me to get married. Only I already had a wife and four children. <laughs> that was that was really um, that was really strange to actually find a, a stone axe head myself. And the people were all excited that I had found my own stone axe head. Yeah. Do you still have it? I do. Yeah, that's neat. Um, the Waurani. So the Waurani already knew that there was a creator, but they were um, agnostics. They didn't think that it was possible to know. Him. Well, Aunt Rachel started saying that she, you know, she had a a book, um, a Diva Monga, that, and she could read this markings on the uh, book. And so Dayuma would ask her to uh, read stories from the Bible to her, especially about creation, but uh, later about Christ, about healing um, and what he did. And it was really... Aunt Rachel said that Wangungi did not see it well that people should live angry and hating and killing each other. So when Dayuma went in the first time with uh, uh, Mintaka and Mankamo, 
she went she went and she didn't take Aunt Rachel and Aunt Betty. She was pretty sure that they would be speared. And Dayuma really expected them to spear her. And I think it was it was kind of close. But um, when she told them that she was Dayuma, who had fled 15 years before, you know, they didn't believe her. I mean, she had fled as a, you know, just, I think she had, was probably just beginning to develop. She was probably developed enough that the uh, Kichos could tell that, you know, that she was a woman right away. And, um, uh, but when she went back, she was now a woman. She had been married to a Kichwa man. She had had two sons, although uh, there was a, uh, I think it was a chicken pox epidemic had swept through their, their Kichwa hacienda. And uh, Dayuma's husband and her youngest son died. Uh, but Kanto Sam lived and Dayuma lived through it. And um, where were we going there? Um, oh, so when Dayuma went in, she started telling the people, don't don't be spearing and killing anymore. And they said, well, you know, I mean, the, their culture really was, was the simple rule was you killed and lived or you were killed and died. And uh, are you, you speared and lived or were speared and died? And uh, Dayuma said, no, that that people should live in peace and shouldn't kill each other. And uh, Kimo, I think, was Dawa's um, husband, the, the couple that had accompanied Mintaka and Mangamo to the outside. Um, he decided, yes, he was the first one, I think, that decided that he was going to give up his vendettas and wasn't going to kill anymore. And the people just laughed and said, you know, if you don't go kill your enemies, they're going to come and kill you. And Kimo said, no, I'm, I'm going to walk um, this new trail. And then uh, in fairly short order, I think uh, Dewey and Minkai, um, who else were some of the early ones? Uh, Kimo, Dewey, Minkai, I think they were the first ones that decided. And then a little later on, well, actually, Gikita, um, after he speared, went on, led the spearing raid that killed my dad and the others. Um, then Nankiwi, one of the other young warriors who was real aggressive, um, started saying that he was going to kill Gikita. Yeah. So the younger men tried to get Gikita to go and spear Nankiwi, but he said, no, I've speared enough. You go and spear him. And uh, so um, Yui and uh, Nimonga and uh, Komi, um, Gikita's son, went to spear and did spear Nankiwi. Um, he lived long enough to, uh, and all this is depicted pretty accurately in the movie End of the Spear. Mm -hmm. Which actually I have, I have a copy, oh, I want to mention it to everybody. Um, you know, if this whole story sounds fascinating to you, there was Beyond the Gates of Splendor, which was the documentary that, um, you actually narrate a lot of, correct? Yeah. And then, and then, uh, Into the Spear was the, the Hollywood version, right? Yeah. They actually, the, both of them were made by the same people. There was a movie years ago, um, with Meryl Streep in it called, uh, Music of the Heart where they did a movie with Meryl Streep, but then they did a documentary with the real music teacher and her boys. And uh, it was fascinating. I mean, people would watch the documentary and then want to watch the movie, or people that saw the movie then would want to see the documentary to see the real people. And then you realize that a lot of the, the inner city kids playing violins in Carnegie Hall was really true. And that a lot of the kids in the movie were really the true kids. Uh, so at any rate, that's what they decided to do because it's hard to, I mean, this is a long story to tell in one movie. Yeah. Well, and then the book end of the spear, which I wrote is of course much, much broader than the movie as well. That's awesome. And then also, if I'm not mistaken, I recently came across, um, the grandfathers, which was, I think yeah. 2011, right? Yeah. Can and that's uh, that's narrated uh, in the voice of my uh, son Jesse, 
the same the same group that made End of the Spear and made Beyond the Gates of Splendor wanted to make a uh, a film about the importance of leaving a, a legacy or a heritage to your children and then them to their children and uh, so they were really looking for uh, an unlikely grandfather whose relationship was reestablished so that he could have an influence in his grandchildren's life. And they decided to use Minkai and our son Jesse, our youngest son. So, and they tie, called that grandfathers. And then they they actually have packaged in Europe. They packaged the three films together: oh, wow. End of the Spear, uh, Beyond the Gates of Splendor, and Grandfathers. That's neat. But, but Grandfathers is really made for a younger audience. You know, it's fast paced, moving a lot. A lot of things are happening at the same time. So. I had to watch it about three times before I really got the whole, you know, the whole thing. And I'm sure I still miss some. Mm -hmm. Sure. And so, um, sorry to kind of jump us around a little bit, but then is the tribe, would you say that they're now Christians or they're just more in touch with those values? And, and how would you, I mean, how would you kind of explain that now today? Well, yeah, a lot of people think that missionaries go and force their ideas on people. Uh, I don't know how it works with other people, but you don't force anything on the Waurani. Um, the, uh, some of the Waurani became uh, uh, Itota followers, became Itota is, the, uh, is what they call Christ, it, uh, Wangungi's son, the creator's son. Actually, uh, in the Bible, the Creator Himself. But uh, uh, some of them did did decide to uh, follow Itota Taro or Wangung Itaro, God's trail, Christ's trail. But uh, the majority of them didn't. But almost everybody, once they realized that there was a mechanism of authority, that if the Creator didn't see it well that people should kill each other, then that gave them a reason to uh, quit the killing. And, uh, I mean, the killing didn't completely stop, but it went from being, you know, part of their culture that you just were afraid of being speared all the time and, and then getting angry so that you could go and spear your enemies. Um, I mean, it's not like, it's not like war for us generally happens to be, um, you know, where you're shooting people at fairly long range or you're lobbing mortars on them or you're dropping bombs from airplanes with the Waurani it was very personal I mean they would spear and you don't throw a spear a long ways you you really you know when they're spearing pigs and things I mean they chase it and they'll throw it a short distance but usually I mean you get close enough that you're actually just running the spear through the animal and and that's how they would spear people too wow that's phenomenal. so it's close it's very personal and they didn't like that, and they didn't like living in fear of being speared all the time. So uh, very yes, quick. It, it, it sounds like the the, uh, the I guess that pain point or that it, it became such a problem that they realized something had to give, something had to change. Okay. And when somebody and, offered this solution or this alternative, it was it was you know slowly accepted and adopted. And the population of the Waurani was decreasing, at least the Eromanani, the upper river tribe, it was decreasing. And uh, it was decreasing to the point where it was hard for the, the young men to find somebody appropriate for them to marry. Um, their, their cultural norm is that uh, men would marry cross cousins, well, women would also marry cross cousins, oftentimes arranged marriages within the uh, within the clan, but when the clan started diminishing in size, uh, and by the way, a cross cousin means that you could marry your father's mother's children, or you could marry your mother's brother's children. Your, your mother's brother's children or your father's sister's children. And that was because when they'd have big parties, a man could sleep with his wife or with any of her sisters. So if you, if you chart that out, you could see that, uh, if uh, if a child married the father's brother's children, they might be marrying a half brother or sister, and the Waurani knew that that, that wasn't good. So, um, uh, but but they you couldn't marry somebody really that wasn't a cross cousin, 
because if you did, if you married somebody, let's say from a from an enemy clan, then the problem was that your children would have um, vendettas against them from both their mother's side and their father's side, and then the chances of them surviving was just nil. Mm. But men like uh, Kimo and well and and uh, Minkai um, and Gi- Gikita. No, Gikita's wife was Eromenani, but um, Dabo, Minkai, Kimo, they they all needed wives. Uh, Minkai had had a wife, but she had died of fever, probably of a severe case of malaria. And uh, so he was living without a, without a wife, and Kimo didn't have a wife, and Dabo had uh, a couple wives, but... Uh, he was he was more into having multiple wives, so they all went on a spearing raid to help get uh, wives, and they killed, I think, almost an entire family and took uh, five young women uh, and girls to be wives. So Minkai's wife uh, Ompora, that's a wild what they call a wild marriage or an immoral marriage, and uh, so is Kimo. Kimo married Dawa, and. Um, when I got out there, I'm not sure how they decided, but uh, the old people are the ones that give names to young people. And Dawa gave me the name of her older brother, who was uh, Edom, uh, Anomenani. So she had been stolen in the spearing raid mm. to be Kimo's, well, I just to be Kimo's wife. And she gave me a name of her older brother. So Baba, that, that made her my tribal grandmother even though Minkai, who was from the Upper River clan, um, was the one that treated me like a son. So interesting. They, yeah. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. And I mean, the, you know, I actually first learned about this story through the documentary um, Beyond the Gates of Splendor. It was, uh, it was shortly after I first went to Ecuador. My wife is from Quito as well, and she's also lived in Bahia. And um, after going to Ecuador, I just went on this you know, rampage to try to find out, you know, just get any information I possibly could on Ecuador. And it was shortly after that, that the the documentary came out and then the movie as well. And I must say, I think, you know, personally, the, um, the documentary, I think was a little bit more, uh, maybe because it was my first introduction to the story. It, it really touched me, uh, in a way, but I'll say I actually teared up in both of them. Um, just because of the emotion there's there, I think there's a point in, in both of the films where, you know, the emotion just really kind of grips you and, and, uh, you know, it really touched me. And so I, I just wanted to say, I encourage, I mean, the, the whole purpose of me, you know, wanting to have you on today is that I want to be able to introduce people who are considering a move to Ecuador to this story and this history of Ecuador. Um, so they can just have a greater appreciation of these kind of details. Yeah. The, um, you know, the uh, the Waurani are, well, Ecuador was, the Waurani were after my dad and his friends were killed. I mean, it really hit the news up here. Uh, you know, a number of books have been, well, a bunch of books have been written about it. It was actually in uh, Life magazine three different times, which uh, oh, we were talking about the movie and the documentary. I agree that um, now when I watch them, You know, when people tell me that they tear up or, I mean, I've had people tell me that they, I mean, they started crying and couldn't stop crying. And and I, you know, I don't understand that because I've grown up with the story. And, uh, um, you know, by the time I met the Waurani, you know, we started talking about uh, how I felt about them. You know, my dad was willing to die instead of kill them. My aunt uh, went at the risk of her life to live with the Waurani. And um, so by the time I met them, I figured they were the most special people on earth. Uh, You know, I already, um, Aunt Rachel absolutely loved them. Uh, She never, for the rest of her life, she never wanted to live anyplace else but with the Waurani. Hmm. That's so neat. That's really, it's really a fascinating story. Um, And then when she died, she wanted to be buried out there. So I went out to help bury her and that's when the uh members of the Kikitati clan that i had known when i was a boy came to me and told me that uh 
they had decided that it was time for me to move back and live with them. And I asked them, what do you want me to do? And they said, uh, very definitely, they said, no, no, now you're thinking like an outsider. We don't want you to do. We want you to uh, come and teach us to do. Like when you were a boy and didn't know how to live out here, we had to teach you how to, how to you know, do all these things so that you could live out here. Now we want you to teach us to do things that the foreigners do, but never teach us to do. And I said, what do you want to do? And one of the things they mentioned was they wanted to learn to do the baga bia, the tooth thing, you know, dentistry. And they wanted to learn to, to do the bimo bia, the medicine thing. And then they said they wanted to do the uh, ibo bia, the airplane thing. And, uh, you know, I was trying to get my mind around. I, I wasn't a dentist and I wasn't a doctor. And uh, I knew how to fly. I mean, I've been a pilot for a long time, but... Uh, so I, I, I finally decided, well, let's start with dentistry. Um, it's not terribly invasive, I thought. But um, so I learned to do a little dentistry and started developing some equipment. And, uh, and the Wawarani picked up on that right away. And then they wanted to learn more about medicine. So I got a doctor to start showing me procedures and things that they could do to... Uh, combat snake bite and malaria and, uh, you know, parasites, uh, childbirth problems was a big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see, trauma, you know, broken bones and things, trying to learn to set them or being able to tell when it was something that they could treat or something they needed to send the people out to the clinic. And that, that really was the start of um, iTech the Indigenous People's Technology and Education Center, which is what I've been spending my life doing for the last, uh, goodness, it'll soon be 20 years, uh, trying to figure out how the Waurani and people like them around the world that uh, are really cut off from the rest of the world, either they're way in the frontier or a lot of people in the world live beyond roads. And... uh, when you live beyond roads, there's no power, there's no communication, usually are very, very limited, um, no transportation that they can manage. And those are the building blocks, you know, transportation, communication, and power. Those are the building blocks of a developed society, which oftentimes isn't that different from the... I mean, if, you, if you look at what's happening in our society now, um, people becoming very egalitarian, you know, a real move to uh, people, even children being allowed in places like the Netherlands, being allowed to decide if they want to die, you know, from the age of 16 up, they can decide and they can get a doctor to assist them. And um, uh, infanticide, um, you know, people not only uh, abortion legal, but actually, uh, legal to kill infants. I don't know what that uh, rule is, but now Canada is beginning to adopt that. I mean, it's almost inevitable that that will begin to happen here. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, like one of the men who made, who, who started the project to make end of the spear and, uh, and uh, beyond the gates of splendor after I took him out to meet the Wawadani and explained how they lived. He just, his comment was, you know, if our culture keeps going the way we're going, we will be the Wawadani. And uh, at first, the Wawadani wouldn't let them make the video. They they wouldn't cooperate with oh, it. Oh, really? They said that the, uh, I took the people that wanted to make it. I said, well, if you want to make it, you know, don't ask my permission. You need to ask the Wawadani. And they said, well, how do we do that? And I said, well, I'll take you down there and I'll interpret for you. And when they got there and told the Wawadani they wanted to make a movie, the Wawadani said, bah, no. The, they said the foreigners always come in and and do the video thing to us, but then they go out and they tell people what they think about us, not what we say about ourselves. And uh, I was trying to, I mean, I they said, what do you say? And I said, if you say, bah, if you say no, then I say no too. And but then I I said, um, you know, you know how you used to live, um, angry and hating and killing Ononki for no reason. And they said, yeah, that's just the way we live. I said, well, the Kawudi live that way too sometimes. 
and I told them what had happened recently at Columbine. And when they heard that, they said, you mean the Kawudi being, you know, able to fly and, and talk through machines with no string attached, um, that they can still hear them from long distances and, uh, making guns that can kill at a long distance. And they just kept going. They said, the, the Kawudi really do that? And I said, yeah, they, they do that. Um, and then right away, Minkai said, then I say, yes, tell them how we used to live angry and hating and killing each other and maybe learning how we learned to live in peace. Maybe they too will learn to live in peace. Wow. But when Minkai has been up here, one of the first visits that he made, uh, our son Jesse was graduating from high school here in central Florida and uh, he had been a really good student and, you know, it's traditional up here to give your kids something for graduation. And uh, I had made it known that I wasn't going to give him a car, you know, not not a new one anyway. And Jesse said, no, what he wanted was for grandfather Minkai to come up here and watch him graduate. So we got a miraculously a, um, uh, um, a man at the U.S. Embassy at the consul, the consul actually, had read the biography of my dad's life, uh, Jungle Pilot, and he had always wanted to meet the Waurani. And I was at the consulate in Quito asking them to give Minkai a visa to the U.S., and I was sure that they were going to say no. But um, the consul, somebody said, hey, get a load of this, you know, occupation hunter-gatherer. He was reading the application I had filled out. And... Uh, so I, I heard them say, get a load of this hunter-gatherer. So I grabbed Minkai. I mean, we were, it would have taken us days to get our hearing. But I just grabbed Minkai and we went up to the, um, the interview, one of the interview windows. And I said, uh, you know, I think they were looking for us. And the uh, interviewer said, uh, no, I don't have your name. And I said, well, somebody said something about the hunter-gatherer and that would be Minkai. And then the consul himself heard that. And he said, I'll do this interview. So he interviewed us and he, uh, he said, uh, is, is this man a member of the, uh, the Alka tribe? And I said, well, they call themselves Waurani, but yes, he is. And he said, you know, I read about five men that were killed by the, uh, by the Waurani back, you know, years ago. And, uh, uh, he said, and one of those men had your same last name because I'd had to sign the application. And I said, yes, that was my father. And and he said, now, is this man a member of that tribe? And I said, yes, he's he's well done. And he said, uh, but he's not one of the men who killed your father, is he? And then I didn't know what to say because he had said, you know, there's an on the application, it says, have you ever been convicted of a uh, felony, you know, a serious crime? And I had put no. And uh, now I had to tell him that, yeah, Minkai had killed my dad. And he had been on numerous other multiple killing raids. And um, the man said, uh, so why do you want to take him to the States? And I said, well, my son was graduating and our kids all call him Mamma and consider him to be their grandfather. And... Uh, you know, a replacement for the grandfather that he killed. And he said, uh, you know, this is a little bit, uh, you know, it doesn't really meet the criteria for giving a visa. But he said, I'll tell you what, if you will travel with him, I'll give him a one entry visa. And uh, so I brought Minkai up here and people heard that he was up here. And uh, I had some speaking engagements. And uh, so I took Minkai, actually it was Minkai and a younger man, Tementa, who in End of the Spear is the little boy who is going to be buried alive. And uh, then his mother ran off with him. Minkai said, no, take him and run so that she'd have somebody to hunt for her when when Tamantha grew up. They were both up here. And uh, so I took them with me with Jesse on a road trip. And uh, Jesse and Minkai are a hoot to watch. You know, they're, what, 40... 45, 50 years difference in age, but uh, Minkai is a kid at heart and they pillow fight and stuff and really love each other. And uh, so then when I was speaking, I thought, what am I? They're going to want to know about the Waurani. So I just invited Minkai up and said, 
I mean, Kai, you talk to these people. You tell them how you used to live and tell them how you live now. And uh, he's a dynamic speaker. So then we start getting invitations all over. And uh, I think I mean, Kai and I have done 10 speaking tours together in the U.S. Five of them we went into Canada. We went to uh, Europe once together we went to India together and uh and then he and he and his wife and uh Dawa and Kimo and Dewey and some of the other Waurani came up to Panama when we were filming End of the Spear and they were the ones that coached the Embara uh tribe from Panama so that they would be authentically like the Waurani because although the Embara are a true indigenous tribe um, they haven't lived as hunter gatherers for probably three generations. Yeah. So the Waurani, the real people from the movie, went up to Panama and taught them how to hold a blowgun, how to shoot a blowgun, how to throw a spear, so that they would be somewhat authentic. Although they had them wearing a lot more clothes than the Waurani wore. <laughs> right. That's really neat. That's that's so neat. Well, uh, I know you. I know we got to wrap things up. I did want to just kind of um, close out with a couple items here. I know that you, you had mentioned to me about a 10 day trip uh, that you kind of, I guess have some kind of part in the organization of it and where people can actually go and visit and live with the Wodani for a few years. Can you just give us a quick little uh, explanation on that? Um, when, when Aunt Rachel died and I went down to bury her and the Wodani said, now we've decided you come down I said, well, I would come to visit. And they said, no, we say come live with us. And I said, well, now Nemo's house is here in a village called Tonyampare. And I said, so I can come down and you know live here even for a few months. And they said, no, you're not listening to us. Dawa really scolded me. And she said, we say now come and live with us. And that's very unusual because the Waurani are so egalitarian that one adult never tells another adult what to do, anything. To, uh, to take any kind of authority in somebody else's life really is a killing offense because you're, you're lording it over them, you're, you're imposing your will on them, and they just don't do that. Except that if you feel threatened, then you could, in, you could insist that family members would come and live in your clearing with you. Now, they'd be eating your garden food and stuff, but... Uh, and I realized the Waurani weren't asking me to go. They were telling me that they had decided. And uh, I realized then that it was serious that if I didn't go down and live with them, it would probably sever my relationship with them. So I um, sold my last business. And uh, Jenny and our, our two younger kids went down to the jungles. Well, all of us, our four children, three boys and our daughter, went down to live with the Waurani. But... Our boys were starting college, Sean and Jamie. So they came back up here to the States and then would come down at Christmas and summers. Uh, and um, we lived with the Waurani for a year and a half while I started teaching them or started trying to figure out how to do things, tried to teach one of them to fly a plane. Um, but I realized that we that if they were going to really own it, they had to be able to pay for these things, you know, the medicine and whatnot. And there was no economy. There really wasn't anything that the Waurani had that they could sell other than their hammocks or their feather headdresses. And uh, hammocks are hard to make and people wouldn't pay very much for them. So I finally decided, you know, we're living in the Amazon and there's a lot of people around the world that would love to visit the Amazon. So I suggested to the Waurani that uh, if they wanted to, we could invite foreigners to come and live with them and they could teach the foreigners how to live like Waurani. And then they would give us tukuri. They would give us money to do that. And then we could take that paper and we could buy the things that they wanted. So we started doing tours, I think, in 1990. 596 and uh, kept doing them even after we left I would go down four or five times a year and usually would do uh, a tour group at the beginning of my stay with the Waurani and then the money that was left over they 
you know, it was theirs to decide, and they would usually pay the people that had worked the tour. Now, they, they would build a, a, an authentic Wawadani village, just like they used to live in, with a thatched longhouse and sleeping in hammocks and hunting and fishing and learning to uh, pull a canoe and to make a garden and things like that, um, which is really a turnaround because the Wawadani always, you know, had foreigners going in and and the Wawadani would take the money that was left over, you know, after paying for flights and things. And, uh, I mean, it was, for them, it was serious money. And uh, they would pay the people that, the various Wawadani that had gone to, you know, to bring food and to hunt and, and show the foreigners how to make uh, net bags and fish nets and how to, you know, gather fruit and stuff from the jungles. Uh, they would give them all some money, and then the rest of the money, um, the um, the senior members of the uh, of the tribe would take, and they would use that to buy medicine, and they built a clinic, and uh, they would pay for the uh, variable costs of operating the plane because I, when I was down there, somebody loaned me a a, a bush plane, and. Um, but they they legitimately paid for gas and oil and and the maintenance of the plane, and uh, they liked that. So um, then it got so that there was some there was a fair bit of unrest down in the jungles. Some of the Waurani had gone to kill members of the last group of Waurani that had never had contact with the outside world, and uh, massacred I think twenty three of them. And so I, I quit taking tours down thinking, um, I mean, the U.S. Embassy really didn't want U.S. citizens going into that part of the jungles for a while. Uh, but now we've started that again. I, I had an accident uh, a little less than three years ago. Uh, I was testing a wing for a flying car that we were developing at uh, ITEC, I-T-E-C, the... Um, the um, Indigenous Peoples Technology and Education Center. So I'm a, I'm a quadriplegic now and incomplete. So I can use my hands a little bit, but they're very weak. And I, I can walk, but I can't run. And a lot of time, you know, the pain and and uh, and disability makes it very hard for me to do other than you know what I'm doing with mm -hmm. you right now. Um, but my son Jamie and uh, Jesse. Actually, Jamie is Jamie Nathaniel Minkai. Uh, we gave each of our kids a uh, an English name, a Spanish name, and then a Waltadito name. And uh, some of our grandchildren, actually, their legal name is uh, is Waltadito. Jesse's kids, um, but they've started doing that again now. It usually is a ten day tour. Um, you fly from wherever you are, either to Miami. And then the group gets together and flies down to Ecuador or some people that are on other, you know, like the West Coast, they'll fly directly down to Quito and uh, Galo Ortiz, who runs um, the training center in Ecuador, um, the ITEC training center. Um, he meets everybody and Jamie goes with the group that goes down through Miami or Jesse or somebody from ITEC. And uh, it's really a great tour. Spend a day going down through the mountains, down to Shell on the edge of the jungles, a day in Shell, you know, buying boots and getting supplies and then uh, and then flying in a bush plane into uh, Sapino and then going from Sapino, uh, the village where Minkai lives, they leave the village so as not to interrupt what's going on in the village. Up, up river about, uh, seems about 10 miles. It's actually only straight line, it's only a mile. And there, the Waurani build a longhouse, and uh, I mean, it's just like it's just like people. Um, or if, if people have ever visited, um, oh, Plymouth Colony, you know, there's people um, that live just like the early uh, the early people that came from Europe here. And when you go, they just incorporate you into their daily life. Mm -hmm. Well, you do that down in the jungles with the Waodani. It's really a great experience. Um, I think they're doing three or four, although they're starting to, I mean, they're, they're really popular. Um, 
and I think the cost is um, $1,500 plus your airfare to Quito. But everything from Quito on is, uh, is completely covered unless you want to buy uh, things to bring back. And that also helps the Waurani, you know, the, they make um, net bags and fishing nets and blow guns, uh, usually smaller ones, but some full-sized ones and, and hammocks. Um, and, you know, after the people have been out there and seen how they live and seen how much work it is to make those things and how clever they are at making them, then uh, that's a popular thing for tour people to bring back as keepsakes from yeah. the wild honey. That's really neat. Well, yeah. uh, where can people find out more about that? Well, the place to get the movies that we've been talking about. Now, you can also... Um, Netflix had End of the Spear and Beyond the Gates of Splendor for a long time. I think, I don't know if you can still get it on Netflix, but uh, you, you can buy them through the uh, iTech website, which is itecusa.org. Okay. And, and as far as the 10-day trip, is that also on the iTech that's, website? That's also information for that is also on the website. Okay. All right. Good deal. Well, um, I know we got to, we got to close up. We, uh, we've run a little long. We're actually about an hour and a half. We planned on about 45 minutes and I, I just can't thank you enough for this time because it, it means a lot to me. And, um, I, you know, I think that this is going to be a great opportunity to expose people, uh, to, you know, this part of Ecuador's history and uh, yeah, really Ecuador, it. you know, about, about two thirds, three quarters of Ecuador is, is Amazon jungle. And uh, very few people, even very few Ecuadorians, even Ecuadorians living right on the edge of the jungles in Shell and Puyo, most of them have never been into the jungles. Mm -hmm. Most of them are afraid of doing it. They think, you know, it's just bug infested. It really isn't. It's a, it's a beautiful climate. Uh, Shell especially is about the best climate I've ever lived in. Um, you get out into the jungles and the humidity is high. But uh, at night, it gets cold enough that at night you need to sleep with a blanket. Um, great experience. And to go and actually learn from the authentic people. And the Waurani are good. You know, uh, one of the Waurani young men, uh, Minyiwa, Minkai's grandson, speaks fairly good English. Uh, but usually they just pantomime. You know, they just show you what to do and they show you the bark that they take off uh, the Wipetawe tree, the blood tree, and and uh, it the uh, bark runs with sap that's red, and they use that to dye string red, and um, it, it's a great tour. That sounds really neat. I'm gonna, I'm definitely gonna do some more research, and uh, I'm you know I'm already thinking about maybe trying to make that trip down there too because I think it sounds like a, a lifetime. I mean, a once in a lifetime kind of experience. Yeah, it's a it's a unique experience. Well, thanks again. All right, Lane. Yeah, My thanks pleasure. again. And uh, everybody check out the web, the website. It was I uh, – can you give it one more time? I-T-E-C, Indigenous Peoples Technology and Education Center. It's, it's ITEC but without the H. I-T-E-C-U-S-A dot O-R-G, or because it's a nonprofit organization. Perfect. Thanks so much, Steve. I really appreciate Good. it. Thank you. Thank have you, a, Lane. Yeah, have a great day. All right. Nice to meet you. I hope we run into each other sometime. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.